over to uh, uh, our city engineer, Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, this item before you tonight on the agenda under presentations is uh, a summary of a study that was conducted by Washington County uh, relating to uh, transit operations, future transit operations on Highway 36. Uh, the study did extend outside of Washington County, so although North St. Paul is not in Washington County, we were uh, considered a stakeholder as a part of the corridor that they were looking at. Uh, so after several months of stakeholder meetings, uh, some public engagement again that uh, was coordinated through their staff, the study staff, uh, and also um, our communications folks here at the city, uh, and several of our constituents also took part in that uh, public engagement process with the study. We have uh, Joe Ayers Johnson and um, Emily Jorgensen also from Washington County here to jointly present to you uh, a PowerPoint uh, and there is uh, copies of the slide deck in your packet as well too but I'll turn the, the uh, podium over to those folks right now and, and so welcome Joe and Emily. Thank you Morgan. Welcome Joe and Emily. Uh, thank you Mayor City Council. Emily Jorgensen. I'm a planner with Washington County in our Public Works Department where I primarily work on transit and transportation initiatives and I'm the project manager for our Highway 36 corridor transit feasibility study. Uh, so as Morgan said this was a transit feasibility study looking at transit improvements between uh, Minneapolis and Stillwater looking at all different types of ways we could possibly improve transit for folks throughout the entire corridor. Um, one of the benefits of being project manager is that I get to delegate. So Joe will be doing most of the presentation and I'll come back here uh, for the recommendations and hopefully answer any questions that you might have. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. So we know there will be a lot of new information tonight, so we'll start off with some study background and uh, some of the scope of the study. Then we will touch on the study goals and give a high-level summary of the public engagement results. And then we will introduce the transit scenarios that we looked at as part of the study and how we evaluated them and ultimately get into the recommendations that were developed. So important context of the study is that our county board frequently hears from constituents and, and we also hear as well as county staff that there's a real need for better transit options in the Highway 36 corridor, um, both between Stillwater and Minneapolis, but also within the greater Stillwater area itself. Uh, so the county board tasked staff with finding out whether it is feasible to bring transit out to the Stillwater area and improve uh, transit options throughout the Highway 36 corridor, and if so, if it is feasible, what is the general look, feel, and, and cost of, of those options? So the purpose of this study is to identify what the transit needs and recommendations that reflect the corridor needs today, uh, and any needs that we anticipate for the future. And as part of this study, we are considering um, uh, transit and transit facilities that would provide travel options throughout the Highway 36 corridor. This study was led by Emily, myself, and our project consultants in coordination with the project management team, uh, which had members from Washington, Ramsey, and Hennepin counties, as well as MnDOT and the Met Council. The process also featured ongoing coordination with two technical advisory working groups, or what we called TOGs. The city TOG consisted of staff representatives from each city along the Highway 36 corridor, and the operations TOG had staff representatives from MnDOT, uh, Metro Transit, and Washington County's Community Services. And here I want to shout out Morgan, who was an active participant in representing North St. Paul during our study, as well as Carrie, who helped us get the word out about the study and the communication staff here. I won't get into all the study goals here, but uh, when we were developing the goals, we wanted them to be goals that would address the issues that were identified during early phases of study. And we know that as we think about the future, we also need to be sensitive to existing context. So. We recognize that there's a lot of growth planned for the corridor, but that some communities prioritize their existing character uh, um, and do not anticipate changing much. So we wanted to ensure that we captured their goals as well uh, in, our, in our study goals. While COVID changed most of our initial engagement plans, we were able to shift to a lot of online engagement. Uh, we conducted virtual focus groups. We hosted and attended virtual meetings. We created digital content like self-guided presentations and fact sheets that we distributed through our city partners like Morgan and Carrie. 
And one of the key uh, ways we were able to reach people living, working, or going to school uh, in the Highway 36 corridor was through an online questionnaire, uh, which yielded over 1,200 responses, which for us was uh, relatively high. And we wanted to learn about people's pre-COVID travel and transportation habits, uh, what their interest in transit is, and why they may or may not be taking transit today. Uh, and we've tried to summarize all that engagement into the following three bullet points here. Um, the questionnaire revealed that 73% of respondents are interested in taking transit, and that's not just the occasional trip to a Twins game or something, that they were um, inferring that they were interested you know, up to five times a week for things like work, recreation, and, and shopping. Uh, that of most importance to folks were traffic congestion along Highway 36, improving mobility for people who rely on transit, and improving convenience of traveling without a car in the Highway 36 corridor. Uh, and in both focus groups and questionnaires, two needs emerged, and there, there's that need for east-west travel throughout the Highway 36 corridor and connection to the, uh, to the larger transit network, uh, but there was also a need for travel within the greater Stillwater area that wasn't being addressed. Before we get into the transit scenarios that we looked at, I do want to review the different types of transit service that we uh, studied as part of this study. And we haven't locked in any particular type of service yet, but what you see on this slide uh, have all informed what has really become a suite of transit options and the recommendations that have emerged. So first up, uh, bus rapid transit. It is a higher amenity, higher investment transit option that operates as a sort of hybrid between light rail and your standard bus route. Uh, it either operates in mixed traffic or in its own dedicated lane. It is typically all day. It is frequent um, and bi-directional service that has infrequent station locations so as to move lots of people rapidly. Uh, express buses, that's your typical park and ride service. They operate primarily during peak uh, morning or afternoon periods designed to serve commuters uh, at the beginning or end of their shifts. And then the local express bus are more like your regular route uh, service buses, uh, but with more spacing between stops. And, and they have fewer amenities but are also more flexible in their service timing and stop spacing. This last one, on-demand public transit, uh, is an emerging service type that is gaining a lot of traction, and it refers to um, a service that will respond on call and travel anywhere within a set geographic region, uh, sometimes even providing door-to-door -door service, and, and this is something that we're gonna get into more on the next slide. So recall that there are those two needs that emerged during the study, both in engagement and during preliminary analysis. Uh, there's that east-west travel throughout the Highway 36 corridor, and then there's that travel within the greater Stillwater area. Um, and on-demand public transit was identified as a potential recommendation to better meet that second need, uh, that travel within the greater Stillwater area. And it's not a perfect analogy, uh, but some people think of on-demand public transit as dial-a-ride meets Uber or Lyft. And it's really been kind of carving a niche for itself as a transit solution for areas that need transit, but where fixed route options have not been successful or are not necessarily sustainable long term. Um, there's no formal route that it circulates. Instead, communities designate a specific uh, service area, and users can request a ride via app, web page, or phone call. Uh, unlike the Uber or Lyft comparisons, uh, these vehicles are ADA compliant and will sometimes pool riders. They can accommodate bikes or other mobility devices. And there are no price surges, which means that the fares are a, a reliable rate. Uh, there are also more reliable hours of service and more accountability with the drivers. So with the stage properly set, I will walk you through the transit scenarios that we looked at. There are four transit scenarios, three of which include all the types of transit that I just talked about. Uh, BRT is the green line, commuter express bus is the dotted yellow line, local express bus is the purple line, and the on-demand public transit is that blue kidney shape on the eastern terminus here. And the, fo the four scenarios vary primarily by where the eastern terminus of that bus rapid transit is. So for example, here in scenario one, uh, BRT would run from downtown Minneapolis through the University of Minnesota up Highway 280 to 36 and stop at Rice Street. At Rice Street, there would be a connection to that local express bus service type uh, that would connect all the way out to the uh, Stillwater, Oak Park Heights, Bayport area. And then to address that peak commuter need, uh, Commuter Express would run from that greater Stillwater area directly to downtown Minneapolis 
And then an on-demand public transit service would be established around the greater Stillwater area uh, to serve those travel needs that we see in, in that part of town, and then also to connect folks out there to these other transit options. Scenario two is more or less the same, except that Eastern uh, BRT terminus have, has moved from Rice Street to Maplewood Mall. Uh, that, you know, that means we deviate a little bit from Highway 36, but uh, that also allows for a lot of connections at Maplewood Mall that we might not otherwise make. Uh, Trans scenario three, again, that eastern terminus moves a little bit further east to Hadley Avenue. However, in this case, instead of the bus rapid transit, that green line taking 280, now it just operates on 36 directly to 35W. And this is because the further east in the corridor we went, uh, we found less of a correlation between uh, folks out there and the University of Minnesota. So we just wanted to test this option and see how this uh, compared. And then in transit scenario four, this is just bus rapid transit, that high amenity bus uh, service all the way from downtown Minneapolis along Highway 36 out to Stillwater. Um, one second. So these, so yeah, so these are the four scenarios that we're looking at. And again, I just wanna be clear that none of these are being ad, uh, advanced to an, a, another stage of engineering as a preferred alternative. Uh, these scenarios were all developed to test for feasibility against each other and be compared against each other for, um, to, to, to find out which ones perform best in terms of ridership and cost. So one of the, way, uh, one of the primary ways that we do evaluate these scenarios is through developing uh, and comparing ridership forecasts, operations and maintenance costs, and capital costs. And this is where we really start to put numbers to some of these scenarios. Uh, and what we found was that all four scenarios are, are, are relatively comparable to each other. Um, if you're looking at the chart, you have the different scenarios across the top and the different um, metrics that we're looking at down the side. And when looking at ridership, while the ridership varied slightly by scenario, in the transit world, these are all still quite comparable. Uh, and so you can see there's a fair amount of overlap in the ridership forecast ranges. And so one of the key takeaways here is that while scenario two has the highest projected ridership, uh, there's not really one scenario that is head and shoulders above the rest. You know, they all feature ridership within a similar margin. And that's really the story across all these metrics. Uh, with regard to operation and maintenance costs, we also see a lot of similarity. Generally, the further east the BRT goes, the higher the O&M costs. Uh, but again, we see that no scenario is head and shoulders uh, more expensive than another. And when we talk about capital cost estimations, you know, that includes things like right-of-way, buses, uh, stations, and any associated infrastructure with that. Uh, and, and so these aren't final costs, but are used to just get an order of magnitude to see what we're looking at here. And again, it's still the same story. All four uh, scenarios are very comparable to each other. Uh, but the heart at the center of our study was, you know, our transit improvements along Highway 36 uh, between the Stillwater area and downtown Minneapolis feasible? And the answer is yes. Uh, we saw that transitway investment in the Highway 36 corridor is feasible. We saw that specifically bus rapid transit, that BRT investment in the Highway 36 corridor is feasible. And that transit investment along Highway 36 all the way to Stillwater is feasible. So then the question arises, which scenario is best? And, and the answer is really, we don't know. Uh, it, was, it wasn't really the goal of the study to identify a scenario too advanced. Uh, the goal was to really determine whether transit in the corridor could be feasible and get some early evaluation results to compare against each other. Um, and identifying, you know, identifying the preferred scenario for the corridor would come at future phases of study and would include many more opportunities for communities in the Highway 36 corridor to be involved. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Emily to get into the study recommendation. It's a slight height difference. Um, okay, so now that we, <laughs> just a little bit. So now that we uh, showed you a bunch of different information and then said it's roughly all the same, you may be wondering, what do we do next? Um, and so before we get to our recommendations, we felt uh, given the time that we're all currently living in, we really need to acknowledge our current context and the challenges that we're seeing ahead. Um, starting with the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that municipalities throughout the corridor and throughout the world are having a lot of unknown financial challenges and constraints. We know that there's uncertain changes to the transit market. We talked a lot about park and rides. We don't know if that demand will ever come back to pre-pandemic levels. So we felt it was really prudent for us to acknowledge we are just unsure about a lot of those changes. 
Um, Washington County was the only funding partner for this study, and we know that moving forward, it would be critical for us to have our um, some funding support from our partners at Hennepin and Ramsey. Um, but they have their own competing transit priorities. The Rush Line, um, for an example, is a is the major priority for Ramsey County right now, along with the Gold Line. Um, so we know that this would not be the right time for us to ask them to financially contribute to Highway 36. Um, and then our partners at the Met Council and Metro Transit, who have their own set of challenges in front of them right now, including uh, financial constraints and then the regional transit priorities. Um, so with all of those in mind, that's really how we started to shape our recommendations. Uh, so we ordered them chronologically, and starting with the near term, this would be that zero to two years, and the theme of these recommendations is really focus on Washington County. Um, so these are the items that Washington County could move the needle on, and that would be for us to study and consider a pilot for that on-demand public transit service, that's that blue kidney you saw in the greater Stillwater area, um, and also consider if there aren't other areas that we'd want to pilot on-demand service, uh, particularly more dense areas, thinking about um, your neighbors just to the east Oakdale. Um, and then continuing to prioritize, maintain, and invest in mobility, mobility management. Uh, we have a wonderful woman, Sheila Holbrook-White, who works in our community services department at the county, um, her, whose job is really just connecting folks to getting where they need to go if they're unable to drive, whether that's through taxi, volunteer drivers, whatever it might be. Um, so really keeping a pulse and prioritizing that work and making sure that we're collecting the data so whatever transit we implement serves those needs. And then we have our three to five year recommendations. This is likely when we come back to North St. Paul. Um, so this is really when we'd be looking to form a Highway 36 corridor commission. So transitway projects within the Twin Cities are usually um, driven at least initially by these corridor commissions. Um, and that commission would identify funding sources, create a multi-jurisdictional agreement, usually a joint powers board, um, and then scope out future studies and projects. So as Joe alluded to, we would need to do a lot more studies to figure out what is the best fit for Highway 36. And that corridor commission would lead that initiative. Um, and we'd continue to work with Metro Transit in St. Croix County, our uh, neighbors in Wisconsin, on monitoring the need for maybe a peak, experience, peak period express bus park and ride service um, uh, throughout the Highway 36 corridor. We currently, Metro Transit does not operate in Wisconsin, but perhaps post-pandemic there might be an opportunity to do so and really capture some of those dollars. And then we have our longer term recommendations. So this would be really developing those corridor plans and partnerships. So we'd wanna think about things like mobility hubs, which are really an area where you can meet kind of all your transportation needs at once. That might be electric vehicle charging, a park and ride, scooter share, bike share, uh, Uber or Lyft pick up and drop off. We'd wanna to continue to partner with our cities and develop small area plans for transit access areas. Cause we know that if we just bring transit and we don't do anything with the land use, it doesn't do well. Uh, but if we change the, change the land use around it, it's good for economic development, it's good for folks who use transit. Um, and then we want to partner with MnDOT and the Corridor Commission to develop what we call transit advantages. This would be bus-only shoulders. Uh, so for folks who maybe don't need to take transit but would choose to take transit, that travel time savings you get by using the shoulder is really, really persuasive when you're thinking about driving to downtown or maybe perhaps getting on the bus. Um, so that would all kind of come in the longer term. And then we have our ongoing recommendations. So these are things that we do already, but we want to start to do thinking about bringing more transit to Highway 36 in mind. So that's partnering with cities and MnDOT on all of our bike and ped infrastructure, because we know that when we have um, areas that are bike and ped friendly, they're transit friendly, and that always includes looking for more grant and funding opportunities, and then really continuing our engagement efforts throughout future transit projects. So as Rush Line and Gold Line continue to develop, we have those partnerships with Washington and Ramsey County, just making sure that we're keeping um, Highway 36 in mind and those kind of uh, future potential opportunities. So that was a lot of information, um, and we're very mindful of the fact that uh, North St. Paul is not in Washington County, so we really appreciate you giving us some agenda time here. I'd be happy to take any questions, and we're particularly interested in your initial reactions of just bringing more transit to Highway 36, and particularly wanting to know if the recommendations and uh, scenarios that we're exploring kind of align with what you hear for transit needs as it re relates to North St. Paul. If you could just fix Highway 36 and 120 for us, that'd be mostly appreciative. Okay, okay, first, first recommendation. Put that down? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any questions for uh, Emily? Councilmember Thorson. Yeah, I just would like to hear some of your feedback. There's an article today in the Star Tribune. Looks like they uh, were discussing the, the impact on the first quarter from 2021 to 2020 and their you're saying and in the first quarter of 2021, there was some 7.6 million people took trains, buses, Metro Mobility, Transit Link, and van pool services between January and March, a 56% decline when compared with 
17.3 million passengers in the same period in 2020, just before the coronavirus firmly took hold. And then they go on to talk about the impacts. Um, the local bus service was down 58%, light rail 55%. The rapid transit seemed to fare the, the best. Their rapid lines A and C were only down 43. But then they talked the North Star rideship was 7,201 in the quarter, a 95% decrease. And that is a line that runs from Minneapolis to Big Lake, a northwestern suburb. So how does this proposal compare to that North Star ridership? And, and you know, we saw that slide, and I know this is really early on and there's been no discussions, but you know, there's a significant amount of dollars if this does pr pr progress. And I'm just, I guess my curiosity is how are you evaluating existing projects and, and how do you determine, I know you're asked to try to predict the future, but you know, how is that gonna play out in this and how you proceed forward? Absolutely, Mayor, City Council Member. Um, so first, I think when we think about North Star, that's, that's heavy rail, that's heavy commuter rail. It operates on a track that rail roads actually still use. So they have to have an agreement about how many trips a day the North Star can actually use the track. Um, so that creates significant problems when you're trying to do kind of all day bi-directional service. Um, which I th has been a problem with the North Star since the beginning, uh, which is why the Twin Cities has kind of moved away. We don't really invest in heavy rail anymore. We've we switched to light rail for a while. We have the green line, the blue line, where ridership is better. You still have that all-day bi-directional service for those areas. But then what you see now, and the, the main kind of um, the service that is faring the best, which is the A-line and the C-line, is arterial bus rapid transit. So that could be described as light rail on wheels. Um, it doesn't have a track. That, that in particular doesn't have a guideway, so it operates in mixed traffic. Um, it's easy to move the route if you need to, but the stops are few and far between, but it's pretty frequent service. You don't need to have a schedule. You can just walk up and get it. Uh, this would be really similar to arterial bus rapid transit. It would operate on a highway, 36, um, but that service type is really similar. So it's much lower cost than light rail or even dedicated BRT because you're not laying down track or a guideway, which makes it more adaptable. So should something pop up in North St. Paul, we got to divert the bus over here. That's easy to do. Um, we are seeing that that's a service type that is really successful in the Twin Cities, but um, I think you're correct in that transit ridership currently is abysmal. Um, Metro Transit, up until recently, was not encouraging folks to come back. Uh, they wanted people only for essential trips only, so we have to take that, uh, I think, context into mind. Um, and they haven't brought back that park and ride service yet, which really is a huge part of their ridership for the region. Um, most of those routes are still not operating, and I think it's kind of a chicken and egg thing of when employers tell folks they have to come back to downtown. If they do, everyone's kind of trying out a new hybrid model. Um, so we're not sure if that park and ride service will ever kind of rebound to pre-pandemic levels, but I think you know, towards the end of the year here, we'll see um, that ridership will continue to grow. I suppose 2020 has really put a hit on a lot of your, your numbers. Yes, it will be a year that we will, um, I think, have to put an asterisk next to for forever. <laughs> Footnote on the bottom, pandemic. Uh, any other qu questions for Emily? Is that? No questions? Well, thank you both very much. It was very uh, thank you. informative and uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you. We do, thank you very much. Thank you. So at this time we have the uh, consent agenda and that is the uh, June 1st, 20. 21 workshop minutes, the June 1st regular meeting minutes, the May 26th closed meeting minutes, the June 1st closed meeting minutes, and the general accounts payable of $318,429.59. If there's uh, an item that a uh, council member would like to pull at this time, they can do so. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. You know what? We need a motion yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a so tough. Moved. It's going to be a tough. I have so moved by Council Member Cole. Second. Second by Council Member Thorson. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The motion carries. This time, uh, the meeting will be open to the public. Uh, we have 
uh, quite a few people, people here who would like to speak tonight, and I'd like to limit the amount to, uh, to about three minutes uh, for, for each person, uh, just to just keep that mindful. Uh, so the first person I have here is John Schmall. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, earlier in the day, uh, we had a workshop that dealt with uh, a subject that was a change in the code that dealt with parking in the ROW, better known as the right-of-way. And no one mentioned, and no one mentioned at the uh, planning commission meetings that I attended, that old bugaboo that happens in the winter and it's called snow, and when the snow plow goes by, it's not good to have your car parked in the ROW. The recommendation was 10 feet and that it could go less, but uh, for someone who lives on a street that has a sidewalk that's on the outer edge of a curb, I've had to call a few times to say, hey, you just plowed my sidewalk that I cleared, that they can clear that that uh, expanse between the curb and the boulevard and snow ends up in the driveway by the city plow. So I would recommend uh, not changing the recommended 10 foot uh, limitation from the curb or edge of the roadway because you don't want your car sitting on the edge of the roadway when the plow comes by. Either your car is going to be inundated with snow, or if the word is to public works, don't plow snow over somebody's car, then you're going to have a roadway that's going to be a lot narrower than it should be. The plow isn't going to work. This or plowing isn't going to work. This was a recommendation um, about four years ago that came up to the Planning Commission. I've been around here too long, and it. Uh, the recommendation was to not have any uh, setback uh, limitation in the ROW, just park wherever you wanted to. So uh, my idea at that time was to call the county and say, do you know what the city of North St. Paul wants to do? And uh, the individual was who was the head of the uh, public works, the county public works, said, that can't happen. We can't have cars on the edge of the curb. So if there is any recommendation, uh, don't make it any less. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think, Eric, uh, if you want to take note of that, uh, we'll look at that later. I think, uh, Lisa, you can, part of the Planning Commission, take a look at that. Uh, Dave Nelson. Welcome, David. It's good to see you. Yeah, see you out and about. Good to be up and around. <laughs> I can recognize you now. Yeah, um, I'm here to promote uh, the water fest for uh, Lake Phelan. It starts the 19th, and I think it goes to the 27th. I'm going to have a booth out there from the 19th to the 25th. Uh, I'm going to be raffling off five. No, seven Bluebird houses, that are $60 houses, Peterson Bluebird, with the price of cedar, it's really tore a hole in my pocket. Also, there's going to be suet feeders out there, and I found a formula to get the birds to eat the suet. I can have the regular suet blocks out, and they'll be out there almost a half a year. I'm filling this thing every other day. What's the secret? You have to show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's uh, mealworms uh, that are uh, in uh, boiled water so that you drain it off, suet, and peanut butter. And they go wild over it. Right now, I got um, pictures of pileated woodpeckers that's been there. I got uh, downies, hairies, uh, nuthatches, 
chickadees, uh, red-breasted uh, woodpeckers. Matter of fact, the red-breasted one's bringing us too young. They're feeding at the feeder now. And uh, I just can't keep it full. So if you want to see something, come to my booth. Uh, throw your name in the, in the, the cup for uh, the drawing. Maybe you win the, the Peterson Bluebird House. Plus, I'll be giving away the other deals, the sewage feeders. So I'm one of Minnesota's, still one of Minnesota's North uh, Metro or uh, Master Naturalists that, that took the class here. So. And thank That's you my for, booth out there. Thank you for all you do. It's, yep. uh, and in fact, when you said that recipe, everybody was writing down, because it's like the next million dollar idea that <laughs> get all the <laughs> bird feeders. So okay. Th thank, you. thank you, David. Appreciate it. Uh, Jack Letourneau. Welcome, Jack. It's nice to see you out without your uh, dungarines on and the oil and everything else on your face. For sure, for sure. I, um, I'm here to talk about Scott Dudek. I, uh, we've been in town, my brothers, four brothers, we've been in town since 1974. We had a garage, we have a garage on, on Main Street. It was just tore up when we came in there. 7th Street was tore up and was... On the, I wasn't even the cement on it yet. And uh, so we've been around town a long time. We've taken care of your police cars for many years. Hopefully saved you a lot of money over the years. Uh, pretty honest people. We just resold our business, as a matter of fact, to the North St. Paul Automotive over there. But I, I don't know how to say this or the, way, the right words or not argumentative or anything like that, but... I think Scott Dudek is a very good man. I, I think he's a true citizen of this North St. Paul. He puts in countless hours. He wears a lot of hats, and I know it's a very controversial thing, all the hats he wears. But uh, I think he's a very dedicated man. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any way that he would ever underhandedly do anything to this town. He, uh, you think of all the hours that man spends helping out this town on unpaid hours, let alone the paid hours. He, he, uh, he absolutely saves the, the city thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars by wearing those hats and knowing everything about this town. So I think it's really take a good look at before anything or before you do anything about changing his status I think you better reconsider a little bit. There's an awful lot of projects going on in this town right now. It's actually just evolving from 1974 when this town was ripped apart back then. And you're redoing it again right now. It's a good evolve, evolving thing to happen. A lot of things have changed. Just hardware stores are gone. The grocery stores are gone. Max Dinette's gone. So what? It's all, it's all going to be good. This, this projects that are going on in this town are good. There's this a lot of senior people, and it can, can be a, a good project that's going on with it. And I think he should still be part of it. He had a lot to do with it happening, and so did you people. But he's a good man, and I really think he should be reconsidered. I don't think there's any way that he would have underhandedly done anything to this town. End of story. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. Uh, Mimi Miller. Welcome, Mimi. Say, Eric. Done. I'm just grabbing the cord there. You what now? It's on. Okay. So I have lived in North St. Paul my whole life, as many people have, and have neighbors here, former neighbors. Um, and there's two things I wanted to mention. One is there's, it's about Scott Dudek, not you. <laughs> um, the first thing is there's somebody on Facebook 
that is under City of North St. Paul News and Updates, I think. And they are very biased about Scott. I thought it was a city Facebook page. And I learned tonight that it's probably not supported by the city of North St. Paul. It's not one of your sites. No, it's not one of our sites. But if I thought that, many people probably assume that not innocent until proven guilty based on that information. Um, so I just want to put that out there, that maybe that's something the city wants to look at. Uh, the other thing is, again, I've been here my whole life. Scott's worked for the city for 30 some years. I've had a number of situations where I worked with him on different things through the city. And I've always had a lot of respect for the man. And I find it very hard to believe that something like this was intentional on his part. And I ask that, again, we follow the rule innocent until proven guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. <laughs> city Attorney, do we, having the City of North St. Paul on that site, does that, I, I don't think there's at, any. I haven't looked at the site. To my knowledge, you have not protected your name yet, but we can look into that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda Zick. Yeah, you're going to have to lower that really big. Oh, my grandchildren love that. Welcome, Linda. I am a real friend of, of Scott Dudak. He, we, my husband and I took over the food shelf and did it for 15 years. Every time we needed something from Scott, he was there. And, every, and there's many, many people in this town can say the same thing, that he's been there. And he's done, he's, whether it was dumpsters or whatever, he was there to help us out. Um, he is an individual that gives 150% in everything he does, whether he was a fireman under my husband, whether he was working at Public Works, any of the projects that he worked on, he's a super guy. His wife doesn't even see him because he spends so much time with this city. He is Mr. North St. Paul, and I have a grievance with you. It is your website that is sending all these things. You started it, you started against the mayor when he was in, and you also did it against the, fire, the police chief. You are a, a bully, and I will say that to your face. Even though you look like Grizzly Adams, it does not make you look any more mature. And I'm very, very angry that people will listen to this man, because he walked off one other time when he was on the council when he was being mean to the, to the city manager, or the, the, the council president, and that council president was never the same after that. He was afraid to do things because of being bullied by this man. So I, wanted, I had other things to say, but that's really what my real concern is. Thank you. Sue Springboard. Sue Springborn, 2573 13th Avenue. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here regarding Scott Dudek, too. I just want to praise him. He has done so much for North St. Paul. I don't think people realize the things he's done. And I've been here for 76 years, and so I think I've been here longer than anybody else in this room, actually. Um, and oh, wait, we got a hand. <laughs> okay, you probably beat me. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Gene's here too. He beat me. <laughs> um, but I think we were dying. This city was dying. And Scott helped these developers get through what they needed to get through. All the way back, I thought about it today and I thought Polar Ridge was even part of 
he wasn't city manager then, but he was kind of the mover and the shaker for that, if, I, if I'm correct. And of course, the Anchor Block site now with the MNI Homes, Quick Trip, the storage building apartments, and of course, the beautiful Sentinel Ridge apartments. I don't believe we would have had any of that development if it hadn't been for Scott Dudek's doggedness. He's like a dog with a bone. If he wants something done, it gets done. And I was going to mention some of the things that Linda mentioned as far as, but I, since I'm not involved with the food shelf, I didn't want to mention that. But I know at the Historical Society, if I need something, I call him, and he can help me. And the same thing with Norma and the toy shelf. We would not have these things. And our community is richer, very much richer, because of all of these things that we have. And it would be very difficult to do these things without him. I, I honestly don't understand who's going to take his place. Um, we're all better off, all of us citizens, in my eyes, we are all better off because of what he's done. He is a gift to this community. And I'm not saying he's an angel. Of course he is not an angel. Who of us is an angel? None of us. We all make terrible mistakes. I have made more mistakes than probably all of you put together. But the Lord has forgiven me, <laughs> and he will forgive Scott if he made any errors, and he will forget all of you if you made any errors. And I still believe it's in the Lord's hands. So that's all I have to say, and I, I'm assuming Scott is watching, and if he is, thank you, Scott, for everything you do. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Bob Van Kane. I don't know if I ever knew your last name. I know. Van. It's the glasses. It's... Welcome, Bob. 17th Avenue. I've got some questions for Mr. Thorsten. The city council, the mayor, is all elected by the public, and I've always been under the impression you more or less work for the businesses and for the public to help the community move along. And I know I've been up here enough, and there's this committee, and you do this, and you do that, and all this. I heard the other day that you resigned from all the committees you were on. Is that fact or fiction? You know, I don't, I don't think we're in a, in a place here to point fingers or Well, I just want to know, because I mean, you people kind of work for all of us, and if you're not involved in the, the business or the park, how do you know what goes on in our city? It has, it has been stated that it is. Hey, that's fine, is. but I just want to know, I mean, hey, you, how do you stay in touch with, with your general public and the businesses? Right. So. If you're not involved. Councilmember Thorson. Like this is the public public portion. Generally, you come and you address the council, and this isn't. I don't intend to get into a, a debate with people, but no, since you, I, I, I can, I'll certainly intend to answer that tonight. I was going to bring it up in our section of the meeting where that's asked. That is correct. On Tuesday, this past two, or it was Tuesday the second. I sent an email to the mayor, and I I just told him I, I'm going to resign from the EDA the Business Association, and our Investment Committee. And <clears throat> the reason why is because the EDA meets on the first or second Tuesday of the month at 3 o'clock. It's been increasingly difficult for me to attend those meetings because of my work schedule. It's been increasingly demanding. Um, I've had to miss the last two meetings. The one meeting I could attend was canceled. I know I'm not the only person that struggles with that. Um, it's, it, to my knowledge, the only commission that meets at that time of day, um, with the exception of the investment committee. And so that is what I was going to state tonight, why. Uh, I have no reports to give, and I'm not going to have any reports to give in the future. Uh, but it certainly would be prudent. I would, it was going to encourage that another member of the business community fill my role, because we already have the mayor as the council liaison. Um, the business association meetings, um, that's, that's also been difficult for me to attend because of my increased workload. But I attend that as a member of the company that I work for. So I was going to recommend that we appoint another council member who may be able to attend, but I don't know what people's schedules are. And the investment committee, 
generally meets once a quarter around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and that, again, is just difficult for me to attend. Um, now, the mayor makes recommendations on who serves on the committees and the council votes on it. Those were the three I was on, and now you're correct. I'm not going to be on any, um, but that's up to us to shuffle that around. So, uh, And the other accusation about these Facebook posts, I don't have a Facebook page anymore. I haven't since March. Um, there's several reasons why. Uh, some of them were that I was posting public notice information, trying to use it as a communication tool, and I noticed that there weren't many people uh, in engaging in it because we get reports on a back end of as a user. Um, I wasn't sure why that was, but again, because of my schedule, I just thought, well, if this isn't a, an effective communication tool. I don't need to utilize it anymore. People can access me through email and calling and through the great work of our staff. There's been an increase in the information I was posting on my Facebook page that's now available on the website. So it kind of seemed like a redundant thing. And I don't know who you're referencing, the St. Paul, North St. Paul news and updates, but it's not me. But I don't think that really matters at this point because you know, some people obviously are upset with me about this. Um, there, there's certainly ways we could verify that, but, I, you know, this isn't about me. And, I, you know, there's no reason for me to get into that anymore other than just stating that that's not my page. I don't have Facebook at all. Okay. Uh, okay. This time, uh, Bob Ingwer. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Good evening. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Bob Engler and um, lifelong resident of North St. Paul. And for Candy and others that know me real well, you know the Engler family has a long and storied history in, in North St. Paul that we're proud of. One of the things that we're proud of is you know supporting our communities. And when I came here tonight, I was not going to speak. I was going to listen. But I've been a little bit frustrated the last few days um, on the uh, announcement of the city manager resignation. So I was compelled to come up. I didn't know S Scott all that well up until the last two and a half or so years when he became city manager. Got to know Scott real well. I've been the um, chairman of the uh, Civil Service Police Commission for a good 20, 25 years. And of course, we work very closely with the city managers on our uh, community policing and all the things that need to be done there. And I got to know Scott real well from, from that interface. And I, I knew he was always a committed North St. Paul person and all the things that he did for 34 years. And I saw what he did in the last two and a half years as city manager, and it's, it's just amazing. And he's an amazing guy, too. Um, what made me really frustrated was the circumstances on his resignation. And it's unfortunate. It's my understanding that uh, recently there's been a, a work environment here on the city council that has been either negative if not hostile, which makes it untenable for a city manager to continue. And I think it's my understanding also that a recent audit maybe precipitated some of the more recent uh, happenings and comments and be it Facebook, what have you. Um, if this is true, what is frustrating is how can the Council of North St. Paul allow that to happen? You've got a key employee who runs this city, who's done a number of things, great things for 34 years, there's at least one council member, maybe maybe more, but one that I'm aware of that is negative uh, with Mr. Dudick. That's fine. But you have four other council members that should be supporting him and showing some leadership for him and what he's done in his role as city manager as well as his 34 years of service in North St. Paul. So I don't know how you can let that happen. That's what frustrates me because now you're losing a very valuable asset to North St. Paul. That's what makes me as a longtime resident 
and a lot of people in this room really angry. Where are you going to find the commitment, the dedication, and the ability for, from another city manager, from wherever? You're not going to find it. You lost a valuable asset because you allowed one city council member to voice opinions, and that's fine, but you have four other city council people that should have controlled that, put a stop to that. It happened before when we had Mayor Keene here, and nothing happened then either. So shame on the council for not handling in that situation in a better form and taking some leadership. You folks need to work cohesively, and it doesn't matter if you disagree, that's fine. At the end of the day, you're working for the citizens of North St. Paul. I'll be really interested to see what your transition plans is uh, for a new city manager. How many people are going to want to apply to be the city manager of North St. Paul when they got a city council that doesn't support a key person like that that's done those kind of things? I don't know if I had to apply. So you can have your disagreements, wherever it might be, but you're one voice for the citizens of North St. Paul. And that voice didn't get heard, and you've lost a really good person. Shame on you guys. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Tom Sonic. Hello, Tom Sonic, 2539 16th Avenue East, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, I was coming home from work tonight from Minneapolis to come here and uh, got off of 36 on McKnight and it's just, once again, it's so great to come in and see all this incredible development that's going on with the quick trip, the storage, the apartment building, M&I homes, et cetera. And I will contend that none of it would have happened without Scott Dudek. You know, when I was on the council, the one criticism I had of Scott, and I think it was shared by others, was that he takes on too much. He needs to delegate more. And then, with the highest level of development going on in the city in the last five decades, six decades, a time when the city manager would need more help and support, the council eliminated four full-time roles. Roles that could have helped shoulder some of this responsibility. And why? We did it so we could have a 0% increase in the levy. And so Scott Dudek, what did he do? He just took it on. Because he would always support the direction of the council, whatever it was. Because he knew that he could just do more. He would keep digging for more. When we knew that he was already doing the work of at least two to three people. So now, during this most active time in decades, Scott Dudek is taking on even more. He makes some policy mistakes, mistakes that may have been prevented if he had administrative help. And then he's pressured to resign. So council, this is a really classic example of failing to see the forest for the trees. Ironically, in your effort to reduce the cost of service for North St. Paul, you will be raising it. You will, if, if Scott Dudek leaves, you'll have to hire at least three people to take his place. And that's if you can find anybody that's willing to work in this environment, willing to work with a council that doesn't want to pay for services and is willing to air their grievances to the Star Tribune or elsewhere. So, I ask that the council refuse to accept the resignation of Scott Dudek. Instead, I recommend that you clarify performance expectations going forward, build better systems for transparency, and hire him an assistant. Good businesses don't look for ways to get rid of their best employees. They look for ways to make it harder for their best employees to make mistakes. They help them be successful. They give them the support that they need. 
And if this council is unwilling to support and retain the city's best employees, then it may be time for the council members to consider resigning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this is very, you know, difficult times for us as a council. Uh, I have known Scott for many, many, many years. Uh, when I was on the park and rec, uh, you know, when he uh, got on the council, just uh, what I hear from all of you is is what I feel about Scott Dudek, and. It's been difficult for us because as a council, we, we thought we did have a plan. Uh, and I just want to maybe have Soren, the city attorney, to maybe talk about kind of why we're here tonight and how it's come this far. So city attorney, if you don't mind, just. Sure. No, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and members of the public, I, I can offer some, some brief comments on this and then Mr. Mayor, is it your intention to to move on from the meeting open to the public and move on to the agenda? Is that the, okay. So as the, the council's aware, you've had two closed sessions to evaluate uh, Scott Dudick's performance. Um, in general, it was time to do his annual performance review. There were stated concerns about the audit and uh, compliance with the city spending policy. In those closed sessions, the council spent a lot of time talking about Scott talking about his contributions to the community, talking about the audit um, and the city spending policy. And there was a discussion with him. Uh, he wanted to address the council, he did. Um, and at the conclusion of that second closed session, uh, there had been a plan to finalize the performance evaluation tonight uh, and discuss the path forward, which included Scott remaining as the city manager. At the end of that meeting, there was also, generally speaking, uh, that the council felt changes needed to be made uh, to make sure that the city's spending policy was strictly followed and to ensure that future audits were clean, but there was a, a desire to work with Scott on that. Since that last closed session uh, that's been discussed tonight, there was an article in the Star Tribune, uh, and there's been a lot, a lot of activity on social media, which has largely been critical of Scott candidly, as a result of that article. What I would say is since that time, since your last closed meeting, I have spent a lot of time talking to Scott uh, about what he wants to do, what he feels is the best, best path forward, and candidly, what, what he feels he can handle at this point. Um, I believe he feels like he's under a lot of pressure. I, if I could take a personal point for one moment, what I would say is I, I've been representing cities for a number of years now, and I work with a number of communities. I can, without equivocation, say I've never had a city manager be so embedded and care so much about a city as Scott Dudick. That, that is some of the most authentic gestures I've ever seen. Scott cares, and he wants what's best for the city. And ultimately, in light of that, what I would say is Scott is interested uh, himself in moving forward and letting the city move forward. And ultimately, while there's potentially a number of paths that could be taken on that, Scott felt like the best path forward was to submit his resignation. And that's why it is before you tonight. Um, I certainly understand some of the sentiments that have been given tonight, and I can't say that I disagree. With that said, uh, I am convinced that Scott wants the council to honor his request to resign tonight. Um, and I've talked to him as recently as this afternoon. What I would say is under the personnel policy, uh, Scott is supposed to give 30 days notice on his resignation. Um, there's been some discussion about making a clean break right now. Um, so before you uh, is his resignation asking to be able to resign in good standing. Scott, through the years uh, and his dedication, has accrued a number of hours in PTO he would like to collect that PTO, and that does take a determination that he's in good standing, um, and candidly would be a fair way to proceed on this matter. Um, with that, he, he is prepared to resign tonight. Um, the 
protocols have been put in place in terms of access cards and things like that. Um, and then simply put, he would be paid for whatever time he's put in at this point and his outstanding PTO per the personnel policy. He has not asked for anything beyond that. He has not asked for any sort of payout, buyout. He simply wants to be treated like an employee who gave almost 30 years of service to the city of North St. Paul and be paid out um, based on the personnel policy. So Mr. Mayor, I'd stand for any questions that you or the council may have, but I believe Scott's last request is he, he did prepare a statement that he would like to have read, uh, and I believe he's given that to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, any questions for city manager? If not, uh, I would like to extend my same thoughts to everybody. Uh, I've been talking to Scott the last couple of weeks and uh, just, I believe, I believe personally he's, he's broken. I think Scott has served our city with, like Soren said, I've never seen anybody serve a community so much he's taken and this is his downfall. He's taken away from his family. And he's confided to me right now is that family's more important to him right now. He needs, he needs that. In order for him to do that, he needs to, re, he needs to resign. So I will read you his resignation here. Honorable Mayor and Council, I officially submit my resignation as city manager of North St. Paul, effective June 15th, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. Expressly conditioned on the North, on the North St. Paul City Council's acceptance of my resignation. It's agreement to waive the 30-day notice period for my resignation, and it's agreement that I am in good standing and eligible to receive all applicable employment benefits I have earned, including but, but not limited to accrued sick time and vacation time. North St. Paul is not just a job to me, it has been my life and vocation. I have served the city in almost every department for over 36 years, responding to the needs of the community day or night, sacrificing family time without taking a vacation, and returning hours earned every year of my career here. I've been a part of and seen the city's rich history as well as its potential for a bright future. I've worked tirelessly to support, promote, and care for this entire community and am very proud of my work here. I have been working with an unbearable amount of stress having to lay off several high-level staff members last year, working through COVID, working hard to ensure all developments continue and don't fall victim to the COVID economy and many other high-stress issues. I will retire from my position with my head held high. Through substantial efforts together with others committed to the city, we have redeveloped parts of our historic downtown and will soon welcome many new residents to the Sentinel residence. And with further hard work, we may soon see a much desired downtown restaurant in the new building. We are now in the final stages of the old anchor block site redevelopment that will bring hundreds of new residents and two desirable businesses to our city. Under my stewardship, we have moved our core city services online, including all of our licensing, permits, park reservations, and meeting management. Our finance department continues to transition to new financial transparency tools and is currently implementing new programs to improve our utility billing. I have worked hard to establish and maintain valuable partnerships with our representatives, businesses, community, and schools. Together, we've created a student bill program to enhance, to enhance the skills of our students while, re, while revitalizing our neighborhoods. These important relationships have served the city well and helped us accomplish many of our goals. As you are aware, we've been working hard together to address the issues outlined in our recent audit and to update our policies and procedures accordingly. This city has always entrusted me to initiate and move forward on many projects, including the purchase of body ward cameras, new tasers, and LexiPol software for our police department, and to ensure our fire, electric, and public work staff have the equipment they need to serve our community. 
I've hired a team of professionals who are committed to serving the city of North St. Paul, including a new finance director and police chief. I leave you with a dedicated and capable team to continue this work. To the staff, current and past, I say thank you. I have the highest respect of your hard work and dedication to the city. You have tirelessly worked to provide the best possible service, communications, and transparency to our residents. As a fellow staff member, I miss you all dearly. My commitment to the city remains unbroken, and I will always be an advocate, advocate and do what's best for our community to help it successfully move forward. To the city council, thank you for the opportunity to serve our great city that I love dearly. Respectfully, Scott. That is from a person that I believe in his best interests is going to be with his family at this time, and that he's taken a lot the last few weeks. And like I said, I think he's, he's broken right now, and I don't, I respect his decision to do this. So at this time, we would need a motion to accept his uh, resignation. So moved. So moved by Council Member Thorson. Is there a second? I will second that because Scott shared with me a lot of things, and he needs us. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. This has got to be one of the hardest things that I have had to do as, as a mayor, and I totally, totally, don't sometimes don't understand of like all of you have said such a great person and how it has come to this and I think we did set him up for for failure Scott did not come from an educated side he came from the hard knocks of school and I saw that so much that that's what it was with the hard knocks and it said that he never said a bad word about anybody, and I believe that because I never heard, even during all this, I never heard him say a bad thing about any of us. So it, you know, with a very, very heavy heart to me, and I think to the council, you know, accepting his res resignation is to me one of the best things for him right now. He needs to heal. So, Jack, I don't know if. Jack, I hate to say it, but that was one of our major discussions with him, and, and he declined to have that. So I, I don't want to get into everyone's comment right now, I, unless Mimi, if Mimi, if you want to, I, I always respect everybody. You know, if somebody wants to make a comment, I, I'm not one of those mayors. I'm not your normal mayor that you know shut you down right away. But if you could keep it. And that was in that was in the in there. The, the mayor, the part of the motion was that he resign in good standing, and as such, per the personnel policy, he's entitled to all of those benefits. There's nothing to take that away from him, it's especially the pension. That's outside your purview. All right. And I uh, moving forward. Bob, you mentioned how do we how do we move forward? You know that's a good question. We did not have a support team for Scott. You know what is what is the next in line? Uh, 
So tomorrow, uh, I'd like to meet with Soren and myself and, uh, I'm sorry. The directors. With all the, with all the directors, uh, department heads. Uh, I'd also talked, I talked to Brian uh, Frandel today and uh, possibly having him as being the interim uh, city manager. And I think I would need a motion for that. Or I think it would help if the council would make a motion to appoint him as the interim city manager. So I would like, with council's approval, uh, I believe that Brian, being kind of the senior person in the in the organization, uh, I would like to have him as uh, interim city manager until we can get uh, dialogue in regards to a. Uh, a temporary city manager in here or a permanent city manager in here. I think that the course may be a temporary city manager so we have time to really look at a uh, full-time city manager. If the council is okay with that, if you want to make, uh, Councilmember Peterson like to make the motion or? I would, I would make that motion. Motion to have Brian to be the uh, interim city manager. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Thorson. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. So we'll meet tomorrow morning uh, with staff. And Bob, I, I wholeheartedly agree. How do we, you know, we as a, as a city, as the department heads, we're going to have to come together and really fill that role of, of what Scott you know, dead. You know, we have to figure that out as, as a council. So, again, this is, to me, it breaks my heart because I have worked with Scott so hard, especially during 2020 was a year from hell. It's a year from hell. It was a pandemic. Scott, during the last quarter when we had all these uh, deadlines to make for all the development. Scott had COVID, his family had COVID, and he never missed a beat. He still put all these documents together. He's calling me up at the last minute. I need a signature. The courier's coming here in a half an hour. And, you know, I'm rushing over here to, to, to make sure that they're signed and it came to the last minute on some of these. If he didn't do that, the city was on the hook for a lot of money. We had some risk involved with some of these projects. And he was able to put those all together and he was the one that got it so that the developer had the, more of the risk than, than what we had. So, so if you don't mind, I'd like to just take a a five five minute break. Uh, we're going to continue the meeting after this, and uh, we'll get through all the uh, all the other business items that we need to get through. Unless Soren, there's something else that we need to do that. Oh, I think we're good. Or house or anything. So I thank everybody for coming. You know, for all your support for Scott. And and Scott, to be honest with you, he listened to the the negative too. You know, he, he respects, he respected everybody. He respected everybody's opinion, but I know he knows that he has a lot of support and thank you for all of you that have given that to him. And I think moving forward, he will also need that support just for his own, his own health. So thank you. We'll take a five minute break.
Okay, we'll reconvene the meeting here. Uh, we have no public hearings. We have uh, city business action items and recommendations, and uh, we'll just kind of go through each one. And if there's something that the council maybe on a table or whatever, we can we can do that. Uh, if we don't have the the information, you know, we don't feel comfortable or whatever, and we'll get through the get through that, and then the reports of city manager will uh, just take a quick peek at that and see what uh, there's a few things there that we could talk about, and so we'll start with uh, uh, item actually B because I moved that up. Uh, so item B is at ZHO uh, 21 level two home occupation interim, interim use permit for Bradley Plumbing at 2081 Park Row. And I believe we do have someone to talk about that. Hey. Eric? Well, uh, sorry. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'll, I'll introduce uh, kind of where we're at with the interim use permit. We do have the fire chief who code enforcement is, is in his department. So he could address it more. Uh, this is it was tabled from the June 1st meeting, so I'm not going to go over everything we went over in that meeting. I have about three slides uh, to introduce what is the item, uh, some of the high-level code enforcement that we prepared and put in the packet, and then from there, um, you know, turn it back to the council on whether they want to hear from the fire chief or, or any other comments. But uh, just as background, uh, we have a request for an interim use permit for a level two home occupation uh, for an enterprise conducted at this dwelling. Um, the uh, request is that uh, Mr. Bradley has a couple vehicles, uh, the trailer and, and this larger truck that are associated with his business and the interim use permit uh, would cover those vehicles. And then uh, working with the fire chief uh, in your packet is uh, the, the most recent, the, the code violations that his team has been working on in the past year, which include um, other violations such as the location of garbage cans, interoperable vehicles, vehicles parked in the yard, debris and storage of it out, items outdoors. Some of those items have been addressed. Many of them have not. Um, there is currently, uh, you know, enforcement uh, in this case. Uh, with that, again, I'd turn it back to the City Council and for your direction on how much more detail you would like. Any questions for Eric? Councilmember Thorson? Just to clarify, the, the item in front of us for consideration is the interim use permit, and that has nothing to do with the code enforcement from my understanding, correct? Those are two separate issues. So the, the request is for an interim use permit for him to be able to park his work van in his driveway as a home occupation interim use. And, and that these other issues, although that question was raised about at the last council meeting, they're, they're two separate issues. Or, or is this information to be considered in um, the decision making on whether or not to approve the interim use permit or not? Council Member Thorson, um, uh, the city attorney and myself discussed that and, and we share the same opinion, but I think I will defer to him to, to explain that a little bit more. So my understanding is, so our law firm does not handle the criminal prosecution for you. Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's an active case, is that? So there is currently an active case whereby this property owner is being criminally prosecuted by the city for code violations. Um, so at the outset, there's, I do think through the IUP process, you, you have opportunities to put reasonable conditions on that are related to the uh, application at hand. Um, one of the concerns I had was, are these business related uh, items, junk, debris? A lot of it seems personal. It's hard to discern that. I also have a concern of perhaps using the permitting process to influence the criminal case. He, he does have certain rights through the criminal process. He has an upcoming hearing. And I, I was reluctant to do anything here uh, that may uh, infringe on any of the rights he has through the, through the criminal process. Um, so that was the discussion. Um, 
he does, the city is looking into this. The city is looking to enforce this. It's just not doing it through the permitting process. It's doing it through a criminal complaint. So the conditions that have been imposed, or pr I should say proposed uh, by Eric, do not contemplate uh, code compliance. We're treating these as two very separate issues. But I guess, are they related? I think that's what's hard for us to tell. You know, what's before you is an IUP for a business. You know, some of this junk is this business-related junk, is this personal items. I, I can't tell, to be honest with you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. What we do know is we have a holistic way to address that, and that is through the criminal prosecution. Um, really, what's before you is the idea of him being able to park his van. And so there's this idea of, is his parking the, with the van, is there an adequate nexus between that and cleaning this up? I, I can't say it's wholly without merit. Um, and certainly if there was no criminal prosecution occurring right now, um, I think that would broaden the discussion on that I item. Um, but I, I'm reluctant, one, to have a city council weigh in on criminal prosecution. I don't think we want to turn that into a political process. And so it really needs to kind of stay the course. Um, and given that's out there, um, after Eric and I talked about it, um, we felt the best course was to treat it as two separate items, understanding that this is the code doesn't permit this. This is not how a property is supposed to look, at least from the city's perspective. Um, but the city is looking to enforce that through the criminal prosecution. Would we be better off holding off on giving this to him? If he was we can certainly wait. I don't know where we're at on the 60-day. We're, we're, we're very close on the 60 day. I, I'd have to even look, even delaying at one more meeting might get us past that without Mr. Bradley granting us an extension. But I believe the court case is before, uh, it will, will occur before our next meeting. And one of the violations that is before him was that he, what, he had not submitted a timely application to receive this IUP. So I'm not sure how the judge would view the city not reviewing that IUP and, and considering it to um, the city attorney's point. I think that might cloud the issue in the court's eyes. If we were to not. If you were to not act. act and on, I can't. Act on this. And I, I'm not prepared to provide rec, uh, findings to recommend a denial for specifically the parking the van if he meets all the other code requirements of the van of where it can be parked, how long it could be parked, setbacks, et cetera. Eric, are we at the end of the 60 day or at the end of the one? We're actually at the almost at the end of the 120 day. Okay. So you can't hold off on something like this. We you tell him to clean up, you know, we'll give you this if you clean up and that's, you can't do that. No, we, we have to either approve it or deny it within the 120, absent, absent a voluntary extension by the applicant. Councilmember Peterson. How current are those pictures? Do you know, Jason? I think they're June 15th. Uh, I can address that the two on the, well, sorry, I don't need to share them again. I will share them again. The two on the left are June 15th or... Um, That's today. Not, uh, it was last Wednesday, June 8th. And then the one uh, to, the, to the right is last, the last meeting, I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to get out of my presentation here. The escape isn't working. Well, the reason I asked is I went by there because I used to live over there and I thought it looked a lot better, what I could see. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better. So I think there's been some movement. And I know this is a separate thing, but I was kind of impressed with it. So. Yeah, the, the, it's just starting to share now. But so the, you know, the one on the farthest left is, is basically the backyard. So you're yeah, not going to see I didn't that go in the street. backyard. And the one, you know, uh, this, the one in the middle, uh, you know, is basically from the side yard, the, the, the trailer. Yeah. 
is blocking. The one on the right is is about a year old. That was the initial the initial uh, violation. Any other questions? No. So the motion the motion would be for to accept. Let me get it here. Uh, the interim uh, use permit with the condition is outlined in the staff report and resolution. Let's see if I got it here. So the resolution is approving a level two home occupation interim use permit to park a plumbing contracting truck within the driveway located at 2081 Park Row. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion, Your Honor. Uh, second. Moved by Council Member Peterson, second by Council Member Wong. Any other discussion? Yeah. Council Member Cole. Um, I have two concerns. One over the length of the permit. The permit doesn't, the uh, permit, the permit that what I read uh, states that this will run the length of either his residency at, current, at the current residence or until his till he closes his business one or the other uh, i have a concern with if if it's recommended to move forward i have concern that uh, you shouldn't come up for renewal on an annual basis based upon the pattern of behavior that i've seen um, demonstrated through here i don't feel that he's necessarily proven to be a good neighbor or a good citizen um, based off of um, based off of what was presented here Councilmember Cole, so when we do some of our land use training, one of the first things we talk about is once a, a permit like a CUP or a variance is issued, it runs with the land and isn't unique to the person. So once it's issued, it's issued. One of the unique, I bring that up as background because a lot of people are accustomed to me sitting here talking about, hey, it runs with the land. Once it's issued, it's done. With an IUP, it is one of those unique permits where we could put a different terminus or uh, review on it. You are able to review the IUP, at, say, after a year um, and take a look at it, or you could have it terminate within a year. Um, it is somewhat of a unique uh, tool where you don't, those, what I would say is the conditions that have been put in right there are standard, um, but if you feel the need to tweak them, the maker of the motion and the seconder could definitely decide to put a different uh, terminus on it if you want. Councilmember uh, Thorson. I'll just say as far as, the, you know, because again, I, I agree it's concerning with some of these code enforcement issues, but um, to tie those to this interim use permit, I think we got to be careful and that, you know, from this point forward, as far as the interim use permit goes, it's essentially a parking issue. I mean, we just talked about the modification tonight. It, we approve this interim use permit. He needs to adhere to the parking standards, essentially. And then he's allowed to park his work van on his property. And that's basically it. But all these other things, I think, we need to be discussing separately and not tie them to this, because I think, personally, it's going to make you know, things more complicated, especially being as that there's lawsuits potentially involved and what have you. So I understand the concern of Council Member Cole and I would agree, but I would recommend we move forward in approval as as is submitted by staff. I guess part of the question was how much is this related? How much of the code, you know, violations are related to the business? That's what I don't, that's what I don't know. You know, is this, Code violations has to do with that truck out there and what's in there and overflow from that, you know, what goes in and out, how much of that is business related? I don't know. It might not be anything. So I don't know if it is not related or it is related. That makes sense. So, all right, so we have a motion. We have a first and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. No, nay. Well, it carries, but nay. Yeah. All those ayes, nays, how many nays? <laughs> and I'm a nay, too. I just, I think that's related to a lot of the stuff is related. So, motion carries. And bear with me, because I'm, I'm out of whack here.
Next one is the uh, outdoor storage conditional use permit. And uh, Eric, you got that one too, or is it? I do. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. And I do have a presentation for for this item. Um, and I am happy that uh, the city attorney is with me as well. We've had a number <laughs> of conversations on this um, this application uh, and kind of how to parse the different parts. But I think we've we've gotten there. Uh, the planning commission has reviewed this twice, and I think has come up with some um, innovative conditions. The uh, applicant is aware of those conditions i provided him the resolution last week i do not see him in attendance right now but uh, we'll go through the presentation so shifsky is proposing an addition of three 55 foot silos a scale and associated equipment related but treated differently within the code uh, the existing operation is a legal non-conforming use within the MU3 district. Um, currently, Shifsky is operating an asphalt plant crushing operation and related uses. Uh, it has a silo for its asphalt operation. Um, it has a scale for different purposes. It has associated equipment for uh, those silos. Um, so here's kind of the summary. Uh, Shifsky has been operating for 50 years. The property is zoned MU3. The principal use of the property is uh, asphalt plant and aggregate crushing, and asphalt plants and aggregate crushing is not a use allowed within the city. Uh, so that makes Shifsky a legal non-conforming use. And in any other zoning district other than MU3, uh, non-conforming use would not be allowed to expand, uh, but we do have a city code section 154.009C that has an exception that allows MU3 zoned properties to expand with four conditions. The first three being the expanded use involves an expansion of no more than 10% of the floor area of a building. This is not a building, this is a structure, so um, it doesn't exceed that first standard. The modification of the use consisting of an expansion amounting to no more than 10% of the approved gross floor area. Uh, when we go through the plans, this is a very small portion of, of the overall operation. The third being when the expansion of the use is otherwise consistent with all other sections of the, of the chapter. Um, and I went into more detail of that in the staff report. And then finally, that the expansion of the use eliminates adverse effects or conditions which are inconsistent with the MU3 zone. And then jumping down towards the bottom, um, that when modifications lead to a more rapid implementation of the comprehensive plan, MU3 district objectives, while providing good aesthetics and functionality during the interim. While a lot of the conditions and a lot of the uh, discussion by the Planning Commission uh, relate to that, um, the way this is written, this is actually an administrative determination. It is not um, a conditional use, it's not an interim use, this is how a use can expand within the MU3 zoning district. So this is provided as background information of things that uh, Shifsky's needs to meet, but it's not actually the standards or the findings we're reviewing. Instead, the conditional use permit is for outdoor storage, and there are a number of standards uh, regarding the outdoor storage, and, and that is what the Planning Commission reviewed, conducted findings regarding, and based their conditions upon. But Outdoor storage is defined as the permanent storage of good material equipment or fleet and service vehicles outside of an enclosed building. So uh, this is both materials and equipment stout, uh, stored outside of 
the approved building. The silos are equipment, uh, the feed stock feeding the asphalt, the asphalt that's being produced is the materials. So we are reviewing a conditional use permit for outdoor storage, and that is a conditional use within the MU3 district. Uh, the conditional use, uh, again, is for that silo and associated equipment. Uh, the silo is considered the principal structure for the asphalt plant use, and the CUP review is for uh, the silos and associated equipment, not for the asphalt plant. So essentially, we're creating this red box within the entire plan. That is where the three silos and associated equipment are located. Uh, the standards when reviewing the conditional use permit for outdoor storage is that the outdoor storage should be located outside of the front yard setback and shall not be placed between the principal building and the abutting street. I will just pause on that of this would be the principal structure, the silo, but this is a structure. It's not a building. So we need to look at the buildings on the site and where is this located compared to that. The second standard is outdoor storage shall be completely screened from any adjacent street, sidewalk, public walkway, or public park. And then finally, that screening shall occur through a wall, solid fence, evergreen hedge, or equivalent material, and that screening shall not uh, or shall be six feet in height. So this is the bulk of the conversation that the Planning Commission had. We have the second condition which states you need to completely screen um, the outdoor storage, and the second condition that that screening shall not be taller than six feet in height. So we have a request for a 55 foot tall silo, which meets the height requirements of the MU3 district. We have the MU3 district's exception to expand non-conforming use, and then we have this standard that the screening shall be six feet in height. Um, so that's what we're, we're, you know, was the bulk of the conversation with the Planning Commission. How do we uh, compare these two sections of the standard? How could it be completely screened when the requirement of the screening is no more than six feet in height? So regarding the other uh, standards of the MU3 district, uh, the dimensional standards, this meets all the dimensional standards. No variances are being requested as a part of this application. This is a picture of a similar uh, set of uh, silos. They are constructed in a, in a uh, system. All three of them are together. You see at the top, there's a common conveyor system that feeds the three uh, the scale is located underneath, so they can measure how much asphalt gets loaded into the trucks through that scale. And the truck has to move through the silos uh, through that armature. So uh, the, the direction of traffic is dictated, and um, no truck can come in following the first truck until the first truck gets loaded. So it's, it's not set up in a way that four trucks can get loaded simultaneously. It's, it has to operate in a continual motion like that. So regarding the screening, uh, they are proposing a six foot tall chain link fence with plastic slats along about the south half of the site. You see that goes just to the edge of uh, the silos and associated equipment to the east. Uh, and then they are uh, locating the screening fence uh, between the building that's located on 3rd Street and uh, the edge of the property next to the Gateway Trail. So uh, again, the screening is proposed through the six-foot uh, plastic slats. Uh, so the question is, does this fencing with plastic slats meet the requirement of good aesthetics uh, and functionality, the requirements of being completely screened, uh, the requirement that only Decorative fencing uh, shall be used that is painted wrought iron and uh, anodized metal fencing. So this was, again, uh, the next level of the discussion. Um, 
when you have code provisions that conflict with each other, you go with the most restrictive of the code requirements. And in this case, it would be that middle one of the requirement to be completely screened. In addition to the screening fence, they are proposing between the fence and the property line, uh, eight white pines, six black hill spruce, four uh, calmer oaks, and two common hackberries that uh, meets and exceeds the landscaping requirement. Uh, regarding parking, there's no proposal for additional uh, on-site employees. Uh, their increase in the silos will make them more competitive, but it doesn't increase the rate in which trucks can get loaded. Um, so they are not proposing any changes to the current parking infrastructure. The second most uh, discussed item was the access and the circulation. First is that uh, they are not proposing um, any major modifications to their existing accesses to the site. Uh, I, I guess I'd say with one exception, we requested that the uh, access, uh, the southern access on 3rd Street be realigned to match with the new anchor drive. And since the first planning commission meeting and the second planning commission meeting, they revised their plans. It now aligns with anchor drive. Uh, circulation within the site uh, only slightly changes, and that is in that uh, instead of having one silo, there will be four silos, but the operation basically functions the same way. Uh, the trucks moving from east to west will deviate to go through those silos and get loaded. Uh, a couple other things, like I stated, we ask that the southern access be aligned with 3rd Street, and they've accommodated that. Oop, sorry, I thought maybe I had some annotation there. Uh, in addition to the other landscaping we talked about, there's 16 shrubs and perennial grasses planted at the entrance there. Um, and then in addition, the majority of the site is unpaved, and the city engineer had recommended that the, there be improvements at all, all of the accesses uh, to the site to minimize the tracking of sediments onto the city street. And who would pave there? Who would pave it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> If we only knew where to get that, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, so drainage and natural resources, um, there are no major changes to the drainage and natural resources, but we are still including uh, the condition that they need to go through all, all the appropriate uh, permitting processes. Uh, there's no changing to their existing light fixtures. So again, to talk about the three standards, uh, the equipment needs to be located uh, outside of the front yard. In this case, the, the current code definition is the shortest street frontage, which happens to be Second Street, is the front yard. It's set outside that. And then I indicated in red where the buildings are located, and it's, uh, you know, it's beyond the buildings. It's not between the buildings and the street. So secondly, uh, is this completely screened? Just highlighting again the fence and then the building on Third Street and how that connects with the fence. The opening, obviously, is that access onto Third Street. So, um, you know, is the six foot tall chain link fence with plastic slatting completely screening uh, the street? And then again, the standard being uh, it needs to be a wall, solid fencing, evergreen hinge or hedge or equivalent, uh, but it shall be six feet in height. So the Planning Commission uh, reviewed it first at their, and held a public hearing at their May 20th special meeting, and then tabled the item for additional information uh, regarding the screening fence slash wall. They then deliberated and provided a unanimous recommendation uh, on June 3rd. Uh, that included staff's recommendations and additional recommendations, which I will go through right now. So essentially these first three were the staff recommendations of, you know, they need to revise the plans as all these conditions state before the building permit can be issued, discussing that the site plan uh, needs to verify that the paved surfaces happen to make sure that uh, it minimizes the sediment tracking. The third one is all the other required permits that would be required. 
These conditions four through seven are, are some that were modified from staff recommendations. Some of them are new. Um, the first being that the screening fence shall not only be uh, six foot tall with vinyl slats, uh, the fencing should be black in color and the slats shall be inspected annually and any damaged or deteriorated slats shall be replaced within 30 days of inspection. The fifth condition is that the screening fencing shall be located at least 10 feet from the western property line. Uh, that's there because uh, the setback shown on the, set, on the site plan was 10 feet. The note was only 5 feet. We wanted to clarify the condition is the fencing is 10 feet so that landscaping can be installed. Six, uh, there is vegetation along the edge of the property, but it's, it's, I guess I would call it kind of wild. And so the recommendation from the Planning Commission was to have Schiffsky hire an arborist to evaluate the vegetation, provide recommendations on uh, some of the large healthy trees are probably being actually crowded by some of that other smaller vegetation. So recommend what should be removed, what should be trimmed to maximize what's there today. And then finally, the seventh one is that um, a number of planning commissioners wanted Schiffskys to commit to, evalu uh, to working with the city to evaluate if there's feasibility of installing mur murals or other artwork on the exterior of the new silos. And as I stated, um, I had exchanged some emails from Rod uh, Stauber from, um, from Schiffsky and they uh, gave him the, this proposed resolution last week. Uh, so with that, I would take any questions you may have. Any questions for Eric? The, uh, six foot height of the fencing, what are you, what are you screening? <laughs> Not screening a lot with the six foot high fence. I <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> was that was that talked about in the planning? I mean, it, it, it came from 16 concrete foot wall down to, to six foot chain link, and then the addition was that it would be black chain link with black slats. So um, hmm. it's had some evolution to it. We, we've had some discussions directly with staff from... Uh, from Schiffsky's and some indirect conversations with their attorney. The expansion of the um, of their business is one of the conditions is they comply with all other uh, sections of the code. So, uh, you know, requiring a variance, you, you're not complying with the sections of the code. So they had originally proposed a 16 foot fence or 16 foot screening wall. They, they stated similar to what is at the public works site, but the, the wall at the public works site is not 16 feet tall. You know, that would have been quite a bit taller than, than what's there today. Mm -hmm. So uh, being informed that, they scaled back to what the code requirement is. So that way they wouldn't have to request any variances or deviate from any section of the code, which is one of the provisions of expanding. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Eric? If not, uh, the motion is for, thank you, Eric. Uh, resolution approving a conditional use permit for outdoor storage to allow for the addition of three silos and a vehicle scale to the existing uh, Schiffsky and Sons operation located at 2310 Highway 36 East. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Council Member Wong. A second. Second by Council Member Thorson. Any discussion? Not all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next one we have is a pay voucher, and that is for the amount of $61,724.66. And it looks like Morgan is ready to give us something on... If you can do that one, and then the number 11, too, I'm assuming. Sure, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, so it would be um, probably appropriate that you consider both as separate items. Sure. Um, 
these used to be on uh, consent, but it doesn't really matter uh, how council considers them, certainly. But uh, these are just a matter of housekeeping. Both projects are nearing the end, as you heard maybe some commentary um, during the workshop or earlier. Uh, and so um, with the first one, that contemplates the improvements on Anchor Drive adjacent to the developments on either side, north side and south side there. So that was the city's contract to uh, construct that new alignment road and the new traffic signal on McKnight. Um, so just kind of catching up with some of the, I think we did some temporary stabilization uh, of the boulevards and some seating on some of the areas there. We anticipate the next payment will probably be the final payment coming up here maybe in July or August to close out that that particular contract. So if there's any questions, I can certainly answer them. Okay. Uh, so the motion is for $61,724.66. I'll go for the motion and ask any questions after that. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Council Member Thorson. Second. Is there a second? I'll second it, Your Honor. Second by Council Member Peterson. Any discussion? I have a question. Council Member uh, Thorson. <clears throat> so I noticed this is one of those deals where there's some contract changes. <clears throat> and uh, am I to understand that these changes have already taken place? That's correct. Okay. So I just want to point out again why you know we've had continued discussion about our policy and and these ongoing changes that you know in the event that something would arise where the council didn't want to approve this we're kind of we're in, we're in a place where we can't do anything about it. I mean, so if there was dispute over something or well, again I'm not going to speculate, but just pointing out the fact that there was a change to the original contract which I understand is in, in a lot of cases a, a given, and that's, isn't that even kind of built into the bid that there may be some variance or something in the original bid? Or so from a financing standpoint, the city typically will plan for a 5% contingency over and above any contract amount, which might include or absorb change orders, formal change orders, or just overruns in quantity, right? So not every... Um, not every estimated quantity is installed uh, to the exact square foot or linear foot or whatever as might be contemplated um, when you enter into the contract. That said, um, certainly understand your concern, Councilmember Thorson, and moving forward, it's my understanding that any and all formal contract changes come before City Council for approval, um, and that's just a matter of fact that's how I look at it so that's 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 what you will see before you moving forward if if there are any but you are correct those change orders uh, have been signed um, and they are a part of that contract but they were I can speak to that those both I think there was two formal ones but both of them one of them was dictated by some changes by the developer in terms of driveway access and the driveway apron so uh, you know they were necessary and and needed to be you know incorporated into the contract to be able to uh, bring the improvements to the expectation of um, the agreements between the developers and the city. Um, and uh, the second one was, I think, something that was certainly discussed by the city council at some point, maybe not with a formal change order, but uh, some of the changes with respect to uh, the paving section and the pavement um, to try to protect and provide enough strength as an interim condition while there's all that construction activity going back and forth on the road. So we added a little bit of thickness, um, nominal cost, and I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but I think we're still within contingencies on the project funding. Also knowing that uh, state aid funds, so gas tax dollars dedicated to the city uh, were one of the primary funding components for that particular project, including the signal, but also included some funding uh, participation by Ramsey County as well too with the signal also on McKnight Road. And the pay voucher 11 had to deal with the fencing that was on the hill. That's what the change order on that pay voucher was. So I'm just talking about it now. Just oh, I was just talking about the McKnight yep. contract. Yep. So that'll be a separate agenda that, item. I understand it's a separate item, but since we're just talking about the change orders, that's what the change order was on that other item. Mm -hmm. So we have the motion. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed, motion carries. P voucher number 11. So this is for the TA Shifsky's contract on the 2020 Street and Utility Improvement Project, which is primarily on 7th Avenue between uh, 1st Street and 3rd Street, uh, with some work on 1st and 2nd Street, including the construction of a pond at the corner of 1st there and 7th Avenue. Uh, again, most of the work is done. I believe this pay voucher uh, includes compensation for some of the landscaping that we saw go in in the spring uh, in the medians, but we still have uh, final lift of asphalt paving to do uh, and some overlay work on some of the side streets. Um, so this one will probably be finaled out not as early as the uh, McKnight and Anchor Drive project, but again later this summer is when we'll wrap that up with some work here yet to come in, in June, probably a little bit in July as well too. So the motion is to pay the amount of $75,664.46 for the uh, payment voucher number 11. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Council Member Cole. Second. Second by Council Member Wong. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We have a uh, Resolution approving acceptance of donations received from April 1st to May 31st, 2021. And the motion is for resolution approving acceptance of a donation uh, between those, those dates. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Council Member Wong. Second. Second by Council Member Cole. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion carries. We have a special event permit application for North High, and they're going to have a cheerleader car wash. Uh, so the motion is, I believe that is the motion, for a car wash uh, by the uh, North High cheerleaders. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Council Member Thorson, second by Council Member Peterson. Any discussion? Not all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Uh, special permit for North Haven Church, and that looks like a, a picnic uh, that they're going to be hosting. And uh, recommendation, uh, this event is in compliance. It's all in compliance. and. Uh, looked at by staff and is recommended for approval. So the motion is for a special event permit application for North Haven Church. Their motion. So moved. Oh. Moved by Council Member Peterson, second by Council Member Thorson. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Music in the parks. We have uh, three different musical acts scheduled between uh, June, July, August, and those are the Brio Brass, the Matt Laurel, Matt and Laurel, and Empty Pockets. Uh, first one, Brio Brass is for 500, Matt and Laurel is for 400, and Ma Empty Pockets is for 400. Is there a recommend recommendation? Is there a motion to pay those three bands for those dates? So moved. Moved by Council Member. Call. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Second by Council Member Thorson. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. We have uh, from our last meeting a liquor license for Target for off sale. Uh, the motion is for a resolution approving annual renewal for off sale intoxicating liquor license, and that would be for uh, Target. Uh, off sale. Is there a motion? So moved, Your Honor. Moved by Council Member Peterson. Second. Second by Council Member Wong. Any discussion? Quick question. Yes. Who owns the liquor? So I got confused when I read through it. It's so it is the application being applied for by somebody from Target, or is the liquor store owned by a separate entity than Target? I would assume that it would be a separate entity within the Target organization because they have to hold. Different licenses. It's a separate entity, but it's all under the same umbrella. But it's under Target. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the motion is, did we? Did, yeah, we, 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 we did do the, okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. 
so it looks like we have the reports from uh, city manager and departments. Uh, one is the, uh, let me get this on here. First one is uh, building permits. It gives you a schedule of all the building permits. It's up to date. Any questions in regards to the building permit report? Not, the second one is the National Night Out that's scheduled for Tuesday, August 3rd. It's kind of nice to see that we're back to National Night Out and we'll be able to uh, get the neighborhoods back together. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and looking, really and, looking and Mr. Mayor, as part of that- uh Oh, um, we have restrictions? No. Okay. No, in fact, I've been in, I've been in dialogue with both, both of our police and our fire, and we have our application ready to go up on the um, city website. Um, I was, two parts. One is we did not schedule a council meeting on that night in anticipation of that, so we're looking for council's acknowledgement that we're giving you a night off. Um, but as part of that, I would like to really include you in the application if people would like to have a visit from a council member at their national night out. And the other option we would like to include is a visit from the North St. Paul Snowman. Um, How is that going to work? No, I'm just kidding. We're, we're North St. Paul. We're magic. We can make snow on August 3rd. Um, so I just included some background information for council on National Night Out and kind of what our ideas are for this summer. Um, I have talked to staff and we like to, we don't know, we're, we're still in this kind of post-COVID thing, but we want to get this information out to residents soon so they can start arranging for their block parties. And then internally we will work with public art public works for barricades and get reports. We'll do it all through OpenGov so we can easily give police and fire their routes on their visit stops. Um, an idea that we were talking about today, um, something we may want to consider, I don't think it's appropriate for this year, but um, in talking with our police and fire, since we are a pretty lean city, um, and you know, we've kind of internally as staff talked about not doing the public open house this year because there's just you know lots of crazy things going on, um, budget-wise and COVID-wise and stuff. Um, and we just kind of wanted to plant the seed that maybe going forward in the future, um, we could consider National Night Out to be our public safety open house and maybe bring the community to us. But that was just something we're not ready to undertake this year, but something we thought might be something the council might want to consider. You want to talk about the next one then, touch a truck? Yeah. So we are going to do, um, we're going to be on the corner of 7th and Charles. And I've talked, we've got public works, we've got electric, we've got police and fire. They're going to bring... Um, an assortment of trucks out there for that night. Um, and due to um, you know safety with children and COVID and stuff, um, we're gonna just have the trucks open and let people kind of look at them. But I guess in the past, the fire people were lifting kids in and out of trucks and, and, and they just really don't wanna do that this year for safety reasons. Um, but we will certainly have staff on, on hand and to talk about the rigs and have them there for that night of the car show. Good. Um, and then we have, um, our sponsor night, um, every night the um, city has, or every year the city has picked a sponsor night at the car show. Ours will be Friday, September 17th. We picked that date strategically, to kind of break things out um, with the car show starting later and to give some staff a break. But that's also the last Friday before we host our big fall roundup parade. And we thought that'd be a really great opportunity for um, staff to interact with our residents and promote you know, people coming back downtown for a parade the next day. So we've got plans to you know do some um, you know, resident surveys and interactions and um, hopefully get some more people, you know, signed up to get meeting notifications and get on our email list. And then again, with the um, intention of inviting everybody to come back on Thursday night for our big downtown party. We're going to have a big party? Yeah. Okay. Everything's a big party. Right. So that we're just basically looking for, um, to keep the council updated and see if you had any questions or concerns so that we could continue our planning. Good. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, so at this time, reports of council and commissions and committees. Uh, council Member Cole. Um, next Park and Rec meeting is Wednesday, June 23rd at 6.30 at Casey Lake. Uh, there will be a community meeting held at 6 o'clock. Uh, all are welcome. Nice. Council Member Wine. 
Um, I think that you've seen the work of um, the planning commission tonight. Um, Good work. I don't have anything <laughs> else to Come add. Come on, Thank underachiever. You, <laughs> um, but uh, our next meeting is uh, the first Thursday of July or August, but um, we will be skipping July because we don't have any agenda items at this okay. moment. <laughs> <laughs> What was it? I missed it. No planning commission meeting. Oh, no planning commission. Wow. Yeah, okay. In July, yeah. Well, uh, Councilmember Peterson. Yeah, um, I'm on the Ramsey County Park and Rec Commission, and Ramsey County is offering a paid internship for people, for students that are 18 to 24 years old. Um, contact uh, Ramsey County. Um, it seems like uh, it says um, Ramsey County means business. Dot com workforce internship program. I think it's really a wonderful opportunity for some of our youth that are in between or like college ages. So uh, look, check that out. I attended my League of Minnesota Cities last week. We were back in session in person, kind of an end of a year celebration with awards of outgoing members of the board. Um, they're still planning a great. Uh, virtual annual conference, June 23rd to the 25th. Tomorrow I start interviewing potential board members and leadership. So I'm looking forward to that. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Thorson, I know you have resigned from all of them, but yeah. if you want to stay so the end. That was my intent, just to notify the council that I had emailed you about the resignation from my appointments, which are to the EDA, the Business Association, and the investment committee and the reason behind that is that <clears throat> the EDA and the business association meet on the second Tuesday of each month and um, it's just extremely difficult for me to essentially take the whole afternoon off and attending those meetings uh, the business association meets at 1130 and generally convenes at one um, tradition in the past the EDA met at 430 and I believe in <clears throat> it was in sometime in 2019 we moved that date back to 3.30 to accommodate a commission member who no longer is on the commission. And I don't wanna ask the commission to move that date or time again just for me. Um, and so uh, I can't commit to it to be there, so I'm, I'm gonna resign from that. Uh, I'll still attend business association meetings on my own private um, employment. Uh, we're members of the business association that I'm asked to go. So I just thought it might be appropriate to maybe reconsider in a council appointment for that. And the investment committee, as I stated, meets quarterly. Um, and with the pandemic and what have you, I don't, I don't believe we've met in person recently for that, um, but I haven't been able to attend those Zoom meetings because again, uh, with a work conflict, just meeting at that time of the day, 10.30 or 11 o'clock, it's sometimes difficult for me to do that. So. I'm certainly open to serving on other commissions or meetings that generally meet at 6.30 or later in the evening is much more convenient for me and my work schedule, so. Okay. That's what uh, So I'll assign those probably at the next meeting. I'll pay one of you will have to take that on. I'll call you. All right, uh, general business, council member uh, Cole. First off, happy belated birthday, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you had a wonderful day yesterday. I did. Uh, secondly, uh, just tonight was a difficult meeting. Um, I guess just support goes out to Scott and his family. These were his wishes. It was very difficult for us to, to sit through. He's got a lot of love and support in the family. It was just different. Uh, it was difficult. Um, and I just hope uh, moving forward that we're able to um, act collectively as a council, not act independently, and the decisions we made will move forward better as a collective council. General Business, Council Member Um, You know, I, I would have to agree with um, Council Member Cole. I think we all can feel the weight of it in the, this room today, but um, moving forward, I, I also second that we move forward as a council in a collective nature, especially if it is um, agreed upon. Um, 
again, I think that the staff here um, is dedicated and committed, and I am very hopeful. Um, but um, I, I, I thank you all for hanging in there, and um, um, we'll move forward. Thank you for your work, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Yeah, I, I second that. Um, it's been very difficult. Um, it's not a win-win, it's a lose-lose. It's, it's a very difficult time. And I wish the Dudek family all the support that they need right now. And there's a lot of support here tonight. Um, on a lighter note, um, Silver Lake is really busy. And I think everyone is doing their thing and it's it's kind of being okay. Because I kind of watch, I've gone there a couple times and kind of just, I'm not... Um, I'm just out there kind of just watching the whole thing. You don't put the lifeguard shirt on? No, I don't. Kind of I used to be the lifeguard there. But, um, no, I think it's uh, it's going good with the inflatables and the moms and, you know, the footballs. And I haven't seen any fishing or anything, so that's probably good. And the boating, there's no big motor boats or anything. So I think it's going good. And uh, continue that because it's still going to be hot. It's kind of a gem we have, and we don't want any tragedies there, so. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilmember Thorson. Yeah, I, I concur. It has been a, a difficult uh, path, and uh, I'll state for the record that I think that Scott Dudek is a great man, and I, and I concur with a lot of the comments that were made tonight about the great things he's done. Um, I understand people are extremely f upset and frustrated, and they feel that this is my fault. Um, I'm not going to comment any further, but I just want to, you know, Looking at Scott's image up there on the board, and thank him for his service to the community, and and that this is not personal, um, but you know that's the nature of politics, and and I agree. I think it's important that we try to move on here and work together as a team, um, and and that's what I'll I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and I just like to. Saying in closing, you know, we're, we're looking at uncharted times here. We need to work together as a organization uh, within the city, uh, the city council, we all need to work together as a team. Uh, the city residents assure you that we are going to be working on this very hard and hopefully that uh, you won't see, you know, a difference in uh, service or anything at this time. But I think it's our goal right now to really move ahead uh, keep the momentum going within our city, uh, get the tools in place that allows us to, to do that. And, you know, starting tomorrow, we'll be looking at uh, seeing what that actually looks like with, within, the, within the city system. So at that, I, I also want to say thank Scott. And, you know, him and I have been in a lot of conversation the last uh, few weeks. And, he is a, a, a dear friend and, you know, just a, a person, uh, a genuine person that uh, I believe had 110% of his interest in our, in our city. So with that, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving ahead. So at this time, a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. I was going to say somebody better make a motion, <laughs> otherwise we're going to... Uh, motion by uh, Councilmember Cole, second by Councilmember Wong. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Thank you, everybody.